Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Professor Kyog is an associate professor in the computer science and engineering department at UC Riverside. His research interests are in the areas of uh, machine learning and information retrieval, although the special focus is in the area of mining and searching in large time series data sets. And he's actually a really well-known name in the time series uh, indexing area. Actually, if you enter a time series indexing in one of the uh, most popular search engines, actually suggests Professor Kyog's name as uh, one of the query suggestions. And uh, he has authored over 100 papers, and he has several best paper awards in uh, SIGMOD, ICDM, and KDD. Uh, today, he's going to talk about uh, uh, a set of primitives for mining time series data sets. So without further ado, it's all yours, Simon. Thank you, Ashik. Sure. Oh, thank you for attending the talk. Um, I like kind of controversial talks or you know, strange claims or not. So here's one. I'm going to claim that for mining time series data sets, that these three tools, shapelets, motifs, and discords, are all you need. But it kind of subsumes everything else out there. And if you can do these things properly, everything else is going to be easy. So hopefully you'll either believe that or not at the end, but that's the claim. <clears throat> so here's an outline of the talk. I'm going to talk about what are motifs, discords, and shapelets. I'm going to kind of gloss over how you find them efficiently. This is actually, of course, very important for massive data sets. But I'm not going to show you any data structures or algorithms. I'm going to basically try to convince you these are useful with lots of case studies. And then hopefully, if you believe they're useful, we can think about how to find them more efficiently. And I mentioned a lot of this work actually with two of my students, Jin and Nguyen, who's here today. So again, the disclaimer actually is that I'm not going to talk about the algorithms, data structures, uh, notation very much. It's really try to convince you that these things actually are very, very useful. So just briefly, I want to talk about the ubiquity of time series to convince you that time series are actually useful problems to solve. And probably you already believe this, right? Because time series are actually everywhere. In finance, in query logs, in even video in some sense can be kind of extracted. Uh, time series can be pulled out of this. Um, and even that that's not typically thought of as time series, things like handwriting or music can be kind of massaged into time series, as we shall see. So time series are ubiquitous. We're going to be able to mine it. How are we going to do that? So actually, here's the only page of notation. It's very trivial. And the important fact is that these time series, which of course can be very massive, billions of data points, we're not typically interested in the global properties. We don't really care about the maximum or the minimum or the average for the entire data set. What we're almost always interested in is small subsections. So these subsections can be extracted by a sliding window. You simply pick a length, maybe say five seconds, and you start it across, and you can pull out the entire set of subsections. And as we'll see in a moment, Motifs, discords, and shapelets are nothing but subsections with special properties. And those special properties actually make them very interesting and useful, again, as we'll see in a moment. So let's jump right into the first example, which is time series motifs. What are these time series motifs? So if you look at this industrial data set here, a question you could ask is, do the patterns repeat themselves ever? Um, let's say at the length of this pink bar here. So do I find a pattern here that repeats, say, here? and so on and so forth. Even in a small data set, by eye, it's quite hard to do this, but here's actually the best answer. So it happens that this thing here repeats approximately right here. And if you look at the zoom in here, they're not identical, of course, that'd be too easy to solve, but they're very, very similar. And you kind of have to believe that something caused them to be that similar. Maybe the same mechanical set of valves opening and closing at the right times produce the signal here, which repeats. OK, so you can find them. What use are they? I'll show you some examples in a moment. But you can kind of guess the utility of this. If you find this motif and you notice that after you see it the first time, within five minutes the boiler explodes, then you actually have a warning system that in future if you see this again, you can actually sound an alarm and be ready for an explosion or whatever it is. So let's look at some case studies in motif discovery. These are all from the last year or so. The first actually came from these guys in Harvard who came to us, and they want to build a dictionary of all possible brain waves. People have been trying this for the last, you know, I think 40 years, but always by hand, by having doctors look at these things and pull out these things by knowledge. But these guys want to do this actually totally black box. Dump in all the data and have a dictionary pop out. 
And the problem is that for just one hour of EEG in one trace, it takes about 24 hours of fast code to find the answer. And of course, they haven't got just one hour. They might have, say, eight hours from a uh, person. They haven't just one trace, but maybe 128 from a skull cap. And they have thousands of patients and so on and so forth. So there's no way to do this actually um, using fast brute force search. Just to give you an idea what the data looks like, the data here's one hour of data. And here's a tenfold zoom in, tenfold zoom in, tenfold zoom in. And so they're actually really interested in data at this kind of scale. This is where things basically happen. At the longer scales, it's kind of irrelevant what happens in that sense. So it's local patterns we're interested in. Okay, so here's the one hour of data. And there are five billion possible pairs you could actually take randomly from this, compare them and see how similar they are. And of those, the most similar pair is the motif. It's the most similar repeated pattern in this entire data set. And as it happens, this is the answer right here. Actually looks a bit like a square root sign. Uh, so what is this good for? How interesting is this? Well, first of all, of course, there has to be some motif in the data set by definition. Something will pop out, but does it actually have any meaning? And so one thing is, it's kind of suggestive. If we, actually, if we search for these patterns, we find some similar examples in the data again and in other data sets. So it kind of suggests potentially it has some meaning. And more interestingly, if you look at the literature, you actually find this actually is a known pattern. This is actually from a recent paper, and people actually have known about this before. It has a medical name, it has a medical cause, and so on and so forth. So we basically discovered this automatically without any domain knowledge. So what are these motifs good for in general? What would you use them for? So here's kind of a trivial example that's kind of interested. Look at some text here. And each individual word is actually a standard English word. There's nothing exciting and interesting about this text in general. But imagine this is actually a, a time series stream. What you find actually is that, for example, in the green section of the text, some letters are unrepresented. So here's the expected frequency and the observed frequency of T, for example, and they're pretty close. But here the expected frequency of E is about 13%, and the observed frequency is exactly zero. So E happens never in this case, which is actually very surprising. So it's unrepresented. And in the pink text, here's the expected frequency of Z and the observed frequency of Z. And of course, Z is much more overrepresented than you would expect by chance. So this is true for discrete strings. You can do this for DNA and for English text. But now with motifs, we can actually do this for time series. So the previous example I showed you, I can actually see where it occurs in this data set. And the two original examples are here and here. And these other check marks are other similar examples. And what you actually see is they happen pretty much at uniform frequency, but occasionally you'll find they don't appear here at all. I call this a motif vacuum. So for some reason, this motif doesn't appear here, and it's kind of suggested that maybe at this time something unusual happened in the brain process. In a few moments, I'll show you another example actually on a similar data set, but with different doctors of, that's actually even more telling than this one here. So here's one example of things you can do with motifs. You can find anomalous time periods either by the overabundance of a pattern or by the non-existence of a pattern. So here's another fun case study with insects. So this guy actually here, the beef leafhopper, is a very interesting insect. It's basically a vegetarian mosquito, if you like, right? So unlike, instead of attacking animals and humans, it actually attacks plants. It sticks in the stylet and it sucks out nutrients from the plant. And that by itself actually isn't particularly harmful for the plant, that's fine. But the problem is, if one plant has a disease, and this guy is going from plant to plant, then very rapidly all your plants have a disease. And this costs about $400 million of damage in California each year. So it's actually a very nasty insect for that reason. So the good news actually is that we can wire this guy up, right? What we actually do, or entomologists do, is they attach a small gold wire to its back, they complete the circuit into the ground, literally, or into the plant, and they measure the voltage change or whatever it is over time. So now we have a time series for this insect as it does its uh, behavior. So that's good news, we can wire this guy up, but the bad news is that data is really, really nasty and messy. So here's some examples, and it's very difficult to see any kind of structure. It looks pretty much random and nasty. So how are we gonna actually explore this data, understand what's going on? Well, the answer you might guess is motifs. So here's this one small subsection of 14 minutes. We look for motifs in this data set, and we find one here and here, which correspond to this and this. And once again, when you see this, you 
can't believe this is a coincidence, right? This is so similar, it surely must mean something. As it happens, the beauty of this actually is that we do have video which we can index back into. So we can go back into the video at this time period and this time period and see what actually happens. And what turns out is this actually corresponds to the moment the stylet is actually injected into the plant. This is what the pattern actually looks like. And the second example here, which is much more complicated and noisy, but nevertheless is the, is the second best motif, if you like. In this case, actually, what happens is the insect builds up some honeydew from its rear, and the honeydew actually eventually causes a bridge between the insect and the plant, changes this thing rapidly, then the bead breaks off, and we go back down to zero here. So the cool thing is we can actually take tens or hundreds of millions of time series data points, and we can summarize them into a few nice events. So prior to this, basically, we have a grad student looking at these videos R after R after R with a notebook looking for interesting behavior, which is not very scalable. With this, at least we can say, go look at these time periods. Something appears to be happening here, which is actually prototypical or interesting or what have you. So one thing you could do with this, we actually haven't done this, but it's something we're interested in, is the following, which is if you find these motifs, you can simply just call them with different discrete labels. So this is, I'll call it an A, this I'll call it B, I might have a C pattern, a D pattern, and so on and so forth. And now you can convert these incredibly massive time series noisy data sets into a, a, a base of uh, discrete str strings. So B, B, C, A, B, C, C, and so forth. And once you have these, you can actually now search for patterns with kind of classic algorithms for uh, DNA or for other kinds of discrete symbols. So for example, you might find that if you see a B, followed by another B, then the next thing you're going to find is going to be a C with a very, very high probability. Again, we actually haven't quite got this far yet, but this is actually next on our list. So one more example for motifs. This is actually, again, from another experiment in e with EEGs, although with a different set of doctors. This is actually from um, University of um, uh, California, San Diego. So these doctors have uh, lots of traces, very high dimensional, very, very nasty, and they have the following problem, which is they're showing people pictures, actually much more complicated than this, of um, surveillance, um, uh, sat satellite surveillance, and occasionally there'll be an airplane in the picture. And when the person sees that, they're supposed to click a little button. And what you actually want to do essentially is read their mind and figure out when they've seen an airplane. So here's the basic experimental setup. So They've actually tried this with various hard-coded rules. The question is, could you do this automatically? And so what we actually do is we look for motifs. So we find some motifs in this data set. Here's one example. And we ask ourselves, do these motifs actually appear with different frequency depending upon what the person's actually seen? And so what we're going to do actually is plot the time series, and every time we see one of these, we're going to put down a green dot. If we do that, here's what we see. So these are basically independent traces, if you like. This is time moving forward. And at this point, they were showing a little signal. And look what we see. So normally, these green dots are pretty much uniformly distributed. But right after they see the stimulus, at the right delay of latency, we see an incredible burst of these motifs. And then shortly after that, it's harder to see, there's almost a vacuum of motifs. They don't actually appear here again for a while. And then they settle back into normal frequency again. Actually, the doctor's very impressed with this because they could actually do this before, but with hard-coded rules that they actually observe with humans and doctors and back, back and forwards. This, of course, is totally black box. They simply look for motifs that are correlated with the actual class itself. So here's one final example uh, of motifs. This gives you an idea of the scalability that I'm interested in. We have 40 million small thumbnail images. Here's some examples here. And we want to find near duplicates. So actually, exact duplicates are easy to find with hashing. The problem is to find near duplicates. And so, of course, these are not time series, but we actually can simply convert the color images to red, green, blue histograms, which are basically pseudo time series. So now we can look for them. And of course, as you might guess, 40 million things is not going to live in main memory. It's going to live on disk. And this is kind of scary because the brute force algorithm will be quadratic. And quadratic when the data lives on disks means a lot of trashing backwards and forwards. This could actually take a long time to do it naively. I think actually if you do this naively with the disk trashing, we look like a, a couple of hundred years of time to solve this problem. There's actually, we can actually solve this. So here's the answers. Here are the repeated patterns. 
and actually they're not identical in any case. So if you look at the dog here, it has a red or a little dot here, which doesn't appear here. And Africa here has something lit up here, which is not lit up here. And the equation is a bit different. So there are near duplicates, not exact duplicates, which we can find. And amazingly, we can actually find these, I think, in a little bit over 24 hours. So not 200 years, but uh, in a day. So one of the last ideas we can have that we use motifs for is what we call motif joins. In the past, we imagined we had just one time series, and the motifs can come from anywhere. But suppose I simply divide the data into two halves, and I say one must come from here, one must come from here. That makes logical sense. I can do that. What would that be good for? So imagine you're a NASA, for example, and you have some rocket telemetry. And five years ago, this rocket exploded or crashed. And then just recently, this rocket exploded or crashed. You might want to ask yourselves, what is the common thing with, between these two things? Maybe it has something to do with the uh, anomaly. So you do a motif join, and you find that this pattern appears in both of the crash ones. You test to see if it appears in the non-crash ones, and so on and so forth. So a motif join could be quite useful. One question is, would it be scalable? Because these data sets will be quite large. Let's see how scalable motif joins could be. So first of all, let me convince you something is, you can convert DNA into a time series. It's actually a, it's a lossy transform. So the idea would simply be that you walk across the DNA, and if you see a G, you go up one unit. If you see an A, you step up two units. If you see a C, you step down one unit, and so on and so forth. So you simply walk across the DNA, producing a time series. Okay. So here's two primates. Notice actually have the same kind of hairline, which is actually interesting. And we can convert that DNA into time series. If we do that, we actually have 3 billion time series here, 3 billion length time series here. So a lot of data. And we notice that actually that the human has 23 chromosomes, the monkey has 21. So somewhere in history, either we gained two, or they lost two, or some other combination that actually separates those. What that means is that if we do an alignment of a join here, we can't expect a straight line, which we'd have from human to human, right? Somehow there must be a kind of a nonlinear join in this. I'm actually going to find that. So what we're going to do, do is take a small sliding window of length 1024, slide it across here, slide it across here, get these two very large data sets, and find the pair that joins the best. So if we do that, where does it appear? The answer is it appears right here which is not very interesting to see at this scale. Let me just take this section here and zoom in on it. And I'm going to add in a few extra points. So the second join, the third join, the fourth join, up to a few thousand. And what you actually see, of course, here is that it looks like, in fact, it's almost certainly the case, that human chromosome 2 is actually composed of monkey chromosome 12 and 13. And you can also see, for example, that all of 12 maps to 2, but for 13, actually, there's two little gaps here which presumably appears somewhere else in DNA. You have to actually go and look for those separately. So the point is actually simply to show you the scalability of this. If you can join two data sets of size 3 billion and 3 billion, you can probably solve problems you know, in industrial scale. So again, I'm not going to talk about algorithms very much, but how long does this all take? So naively, it would take n squared time to compare all to all, and that for any non-trivial data set would be very, very nasty. And for that reason, there's dozens of researchers have solved this problem approximately, typically in n log n time with very high constants, but only for approximate answers. So the answer they give you is good and not the optimal. So recently, Wynn, one of my students here, uh, has come up with a beautiful exact algorithm, which is actually incredibly fast. And to give an idea how fast it is, for the EEG data set, those guys who are very smart computer scientists and PhD and, and um, medical doctors, they can actually solve this for one hour in 24 hours, one hour of data. We can actually do one hour of data in about two minutes. And again, for the other example with 40 million time series, which live on disk, we can solve this in, I say hours, so actually it's probably tens of hours, let's say a day or two. So actually it really is scalable enough to handle these massive data sets. So just a quick summary of motifs, and I'll go on to the other examples. We can find motifs now in very large data sets. And they have some potentially very interesting things we can do with them. We can monitor the frequency of these motifs in the data stream through the anomaly detection. And we can even sound an alarm if we don't see a pattern, right? If I don't see this pattern for five minutes, that's unusual. I can sound an alarm. Usually, motif 
Usually anomaly detection only works when you see something. This actually could work when you don't see something, which is quite interesting. And there's a few things we could do with this, like find the motifs on streams, which is kind of basically future work. Okay, shift gears very slightly and talk about something different, which is shapelets. Actually, shapelets are basically supervised motifs, as we'll see. So I'm going to show you this actually in the shape domain, but it works really for time series, as we'll see in a moment. So here we have two different classes of uh, shapes, stinging nettles and false nettles. Let's say you want to classify these, tell them apart. One problem actually is that they look very, very similar at a global scale. And the problem is that they also can have insect damage, like we have here. So any kind of a global measure tends to work very, very badly. So the idea of shapeless actually is to say, let's ignore the global measures. Let's try to zoom in and find local patterns that might tell these things apart. So how are we going to do this? So first of all, we take the shape and convert it to a time series. There are many ways of doing that. We have a way of doing it, but it doesn't really matter too much. The point is actually this is a one-to-one map, and I can go back from this to the original shape if I want to. And again, this is actually a global pattern for a leaf now, but small subsections of it, like the subsection here, might be all it takes to distinguish these two classes. So we're going to actually look for all possible subsequences to find the best such pattern. And it happens to be, in fact, this one right here. So what I actually see is that for false nettles, the pattern looks like this. But the closest possible pattern in the uh, true nettles actually looks radically different. And the reason now is obvious. For true nettles, the leaf joins at 90 degrees, essentially 90 degrees. But for the false nettles, the angle is much shallower. Now that you actually know that rule, if you look back, you say, oh yeah, that kind of makes sense. So you can actually use this fact to make a decision tree very easily, right? The decision tree works like this. You simply get a new leaf to classify. You find all the subsequences of the right length, and you compare it to this one here. If one of those, um, shape, one of those um, subsequences is less than 5.1 from this, you say it's a false nettle. Otherwise, you say it's a true nettle. And actually, as it happens, of course, in this case, it's very robust to leaf bites, especially if they're around here. One cool thing about this actually is not only can it classify very accurately in many cases, but unlike other classifiers, it tells you why. Right? So we get accurate results here, but we can also go back and brush this onto the shape and say the reason why these two things are different has something to do with whatever happens around here, and we actually figure out why the difference exists, which is very useful in some domains. So briefly, how do we actually decide which shapelet is the one to use? So for this subsequence here, I have to test every possible subsequence from everywhere of every possible length from tiny to very, very long from every single shape in my database. So how do I actually choose this particular subsequence to be in a shapelet? Well, for every subsequence candidate, what I do is I put it here, and I sort all the objects in my database based upon the distance to that candidate. And what I hope to find is that on my number line, all of one class, let's say the blue class, is on this side, all of the red class is on this side, and I can separate them with a clean split point here. In this example, actually, I have a pretty good example, not a perfect example. One thing here actually is out of order. Maybe a different shape that would actually would pull this blue thing back here, this red thing back here, out of a perfect separation. Now, one small problem with this actually is that if I do this naively, it could take a long time. So even for a tiny toy, toy data set of length 200 with 200 objects in it, it's about 8.5 million these calculations to do. And each one of these calculations actually isn't just moving dots around. Each time you place a dot, you have to do a lot of distance measures to different things. So naively, it could take a long time. But as you may guess, we actually have ways of speeding up, which I'll briefly talk about in a moment. Just to convince you that actually they're useful, here again, some visual domains. On my campus, actually, we have one million of these things, our heads, mostly in cardboard boxes. They've never actually been photographed. But we're actually able to classify them. And not only classify them, but classify them by being robust to things like broken uh, points, and classify them with some explanation of why they're classified that way. So we've done this, and here's the answer. So again, we can take these potential points, we can build a decision tree, which actually is quite accurate as it happens, but it also tells you why it made a decision in some sense. So the first split here is based upon this subsequence here, which corresponds, if I brush it back, to this section here. So what it basically says is, if you have this kind of a deep concave dish at the base, 
you are a Clovis. That's what defines a Clovis. It isn't this point here because actually it's very common in all kinds of things. But this is unique to Clovis. And likewise, the second subtree here has a decision based upon this shape here, which you can brush back to this. And what it basically says is, if you have a side notch here, you're Avalona. But if you don't, you're not. And that makes a split right here. So once again, we're actually more accurate. We're a lot faster to actually classify, which is kind of not that important in this domain. In some domains it can be. But the real cool thing actually is, it's telling you why it made the decision. One last example before I move on. This is a classic uh, problem called gun, no gun. And the young lady in question is either pointing over, the, over there at the wall, or she's pointing a gun at the wall. And I want to classify this. We can do this quite accurately, a little more accurate than previous uh, people have done this. But more importantly, actually, it's going to tell you why I made the decision. So the shape that actually brushes back here, which I can brush back into the video, and what it turns out actually is that in this case, the young lady has, is quite a small young lady, has a very heavy gun. As she puts it back on her holster, it basically has to overshoot. The inertia carries her hand further past the holster, then she puts it back in again. It's a subtle thing, but it only occurs in this example, as we can actually guess then it's the difference between the two classes. So just a brief one slide to show you the scalability and the accuracy on a classic benchmark. So finding the shapelets is a slow part. Once you find them, classification is a decision tree, it's incredibly fast. But finding can be quite slow. So here in this classic data set, to find the best shapelet can take us, in a brute force algorithm, about five days. With some clever pruning ideas, we can actually find the exact answer in a few minutes instead. So we can actually find things reasonably fast for large data sets. More interestingly actually is we made a lot more accurate than many people in many domains. So here actually in this problem there's actually 2,000 things in the training set. If we just use 10 of those things, a tiny fraction of the training set, well not quite as good as the best known approach in the world. But if we use 20 things, which is only 1% um, of the entire data set, we're already better than the best approach. And as we add a few more things in we get better and better again. And so why are we so much better than everything else? The trick is basically the shape in this case it actually finds the pattern just right here is the key difference. Shapelets can actually ignore most of the data. And as it happens for many problems, throwing away most of the data is the key thing, right? The difference is only in a small, subtle place, and shapelets can do that. All the other approaches are basically forced, forced to account for all the data. You're going to find some noise, you're going to overfit, you're going to cause problems. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about are time series discords, which again are simply just some all subsequences with special properties. So what's the property in this case? So these chords are the subsequences which are maximally far from the nearest neighbor. So for example, if I had this subsection here, it actually looks like that one there. Or if I have this subsection here, it looks pretty much like that subsection there. But as it happens, for this subsection here, its nearest neighbor somewhere in here is very, very far away. And that's what the definition of this chord actually is. As it happens in this case, it does correspond to a known phenomenon in the spatial data set. So it's found a true anomaly. So here's some examples of this chords. Uh, here's a web log we had from you guys a couple years ago. And you can see that most things have kind of classic patterns. So many things have this daily periodicity. I guess it's because people simply go to work and have more internet access at work. And something actually have well-known patterns. So here's actually a pattern you see, which I call anticipated burst, um, for movies or book, uh, new books, whatever it is. What you see actually is a big build-up in excitement. The movie's released, and then people get a bit bored, and the excitement falls off. And of course, what is this bump here? DVDs, right? Actually, you see a kind of similar pattern, but a little bit different for dead celebrities. So for dead celebrities, you see a small back on interest, He's found dead in Bangkok or whatever it is. You see a big spike in interest, which falls off again, right? So the point actually is that most things are similar to something else. So um, Germany might be similar to Austria. Stock market might be, interested to, might be similar to finance. Spider-Man is similar to Star Wars and so on and so forth. So by given this, what's the most unusual thing you can find in all the uh, English words? It's a tough puzzle, right? It's not easy, but it is. The answer actually is... Full moon. And why is that? Well, most things have a periodicity of a day. 
something to have a periodicity of one year, something to have a periodicity of a month. At the end of the month, your insurance expires. People look for insurance at the end of the month for some reason, right? But full moon is the only thing that has a periodicity of exactly that of a full moon. And so its periodicity is unlike everything else in the world. It's the only thing you can observe from anywhere on the planet, and people apparently go out for a walk, see the full moon, that looks pretty, they go home, they hit the search engine, they type in full moon. And so the periodicity is exactly that of a lunar month. Kind of an interesting little puzzle there. I'm not going to beat this to death, but these disk cores actually work not only in one-dimensional space, but also in two-dimensional, three-dimensional other spaces. And the cool thing actually is they work incredibly well. So we've actually compared this to many other approaches. And the problem is many approaches find anomalies in time series typically have four or five or six parameters. And you have to tune them and set them. And you can make them work well for one data set. But they rarely generalize to other data sets. The cool thing about this course actually is, is they have exactly one parameter, which is the length of them. Once you set that, there's nothing else you can tune. You walk away, it gives you the answer. And surprisingly, it often is the right answer. So I think actually simplicity here is not a weakness, it's a strength. Because if you have lots of parameters, you are going to overfit. It's almost impossible to avoid that. I was talking about this in great detail, but actually one question is, how do you know that the discord you find is really unusual? Because once again, there has to be some kind of discord in every data set, even if it's not very meaningful. So one trick you can do is, in this case, there's a data set that has two real anomalies, which are known by external sources. If you simply sort them based upon the discord distance, what you actually find is that the background normal stuff is relatively low, and there's a big jump discontinuity in true discords. So by looking at this plot here with a, a knee plot, an elbow plot, you can probably kind of guess that this actually corresponds to the threshold for true anomalies in this data set. Just for fun, let's go back to the example we have with this uh, young lady with the um, gun. So in the entire video sequence, which is quite long, we actually looked for discords in two-dimensional space, and we found actually it exists right here. So why is this unusual? Once again, we go back to the original video and find the answer. So normally the girl is very diligent and she points the gun, returns the gun, points the gun multiple times for this video. But in one sequence, beginning right here, she returns the gun and she actually misses the holster. So she fumbles around a little bit. She gets embarrassed. She looks at the cameraman. She begins to double over and laughs and jokes around, then realizes she's wasting time and gets back into her character and returns back to normal. So here this court finds in two-dimensional space the interest and unusual anomaly for this data set. Once again, if you do this naively, it could be really, really nasty because the Discord algorithm requires you to actually look for every subsequence compared to every other subsequence. So it's quadratic, and quadratic algorithms can be nasty, especially if the data lives on disk. But as it happens, we have a very nice algorithm that you can do this very, very fast. So for disk, it takes basically two scans of the data, and you can find the right answer. So we can do this actually for 100 million objects, which is about a third of a terabyte, in about 90 hours. It's actually a few years old, now it's probably a little bit better than that. But again, it's actually very impressive. A brute force algorithm for this would take thousands of years. So again, I know you might not be that impressed, you guys at Microsoft, at 100 million objects, but by most academic standards, that's a really, really, really big data set. Just for fun, how big is it? So the classic thing you say is a needle in a haystack. Suppose that actually all the time series in the 100 million example I gave you uh, was a straw in a haystack. How big is the haystack? Well, the haystack would be about this size. This is actually the scale, the 262 meters. As it happens, this is actually a much harder problem than a needle in a haystack because when you find the needle, you know you found the needle and you're done. What I'm really asking you here is find the one piece of straw that's least like all the other pieces of straw. That's a much harder problem. And again, it's kind of surprising you can find the exact answer in you know, at tens of hours and not thousands of years. So again, I've been selling these Discord ideas for a while. They're very, very simple, almost insultingly simple, but work very well. And recently, I got some nice independent confirmation of that. So Vipin Kumar actually had some students test this. So they tested on 19 very different kinds of data sets from all kinds of domains. And they tested the nine most famous techniques of anomaly detection uh, out there. And they actually found that Discords win virtually every time. I think once or twice, they come in second place. But essentially, Discords, even though they're insultingly simple, work incredibly well. And I should make the same claim for shapelets and for motifs. They're very, very simple ideas, but simple ideas tend to work very well, in my experience. And certainly, in every domain we've tried, this has been the case. 
And again, the reason I think they actually do work so well is because there's basically very few parameters to, to, to mess with, essentially. The only parameter really is the length, and even that, in some cases, you actually can remove that as a parameter, and have no parameters. And finally, they actually are scalable and parallelizable. You can actually do all kinds of clever tricks to make this really, really fast. What I would like to do, we haven't done yet, actually, is to port this to streaming data. So imagine instead of saying, in this batch data set, what's the discord, or motif, saying, in the last one hour of a window that moves forever, what's the most unusual discord you've seen? What's the best motif you've seen? Those are tricky problems. In the motif case, actually, we maybe can find it, the answer. Min's working on that. For the discord case, actually, it's quite difficult, and we're not sure if the answer can be actually computed exactly. Great. So the overall conclusions. Motifs, motif joins, shapeless discords are really very simple but very effective tools that we can use for understanding massive, massive data sets, at least in the batch case and potentially also in the streaming case. My personal philosophy is that, motif, uh, that uh, parameters are bad, that every time you add one parameter, you have the utility of your idea. So if you have a reasonably good idea and you have five parameters, you have how good it is, half it again, half it again, half it again, it's not that good of an idea basically. And motifs and all these other things are great because they're very few or no parameters. And as always, if you have cool data sets, cool problems, we're very interested in those. Uh, before I go, a quick plug. I'm giving a talk next week in Paris, a tutorial, on how to do good research. It's basically designed for young uh, faculty and grad students who kind of, uh, maybe not from a big powerhouse like CMU or MIT, who are trying to do you know, good research and actually get it published. And uh, I've got a lot of great ideas from people all over the world. If you have any interesting ideas for helping these people, these grad students and in faculty, I'd love to hear them. So again, it might be simply that you have reviewed papers recently and you said, these guys had a good paper, but they did this and it condemned the paper. So what is this that condemned the paper? If you tell me, I'll try to summarize that and actually give that information back out to the community. Great, I'm all done at this point. Any questions, comments? Sir. Um, so you were, the, your one parameter is the window size. Yes. So how do you, how do you handle that, say, in, in your motifs? So it's actually, it's surprisingly easy in many cases. So uh, like for cardiology, the doctors will tell you that the interesting stuff happens at about one second. What happens in five minutes is kind of irrelevant because it's kind of drift in that range. It makes no difference. And what happens at a millisecond in a heartbeat has almost no interest too, right? So they kind of know the natural scale for interesting stuff is about that. For the entomology thing, again, the entomologist suggests that the right scale actually is about two or three seconds, right? That beyond that, it's kind of random, and less than that, you might miss things. So one thing is simply to ask the expert. Something else you can do, of course, is you can basically, because it's efficient enough, is you can search over some range. So essentially, you would say, uh, pick half a second and double that a few times, and with some statistic, measure the statistical significance of what you find, and you'd say, actually, I think the real length is actually 2.1 seconds, and here's what we find at that range. Uh, so a combination of domain experts and a little bit of search over parameters uh, usually solves the problem. Do you think there might be a way to automate that, like look at, I don't know, fractal dimension or Fourier transforms along those lines? Uh, I think there probably is some way of doing that. I mean, um, um, maybe someone more statistically smart than me, potentially, right? Uh, it's probably the, the true answer. But my guess actually is some kind of entropy would actually make this, right? So one way actually we're looking at doing this is actually is by looking at this problem as a compression problem. So if you actually have motifs, you can compress well. Because you simply just take the occurrence of the motif, you give it a letter A in your dictionary, and you kind of compress the data. So if you basically say, well, the best motif lengths are the one that compress the data the most, which actually has some kind of plausibility in some domains, then actually you could simply just do a hands-off thing, find the best compression, and say, this is the true structure you could actually have. And we actually are working on that. Continue with that question. I mean, uh, for example, if you look at the mot for various, uh, you know, the size of the sliding window, if you look at the motives, the meaningfulness of the motives will probably give some clue about whether that's a right window or not, right? If it's a too short window, okay, you get a lot of kind of false motives. But on the, if it's too long, no motives at all. And it's true. It is somewhat domain dependent, but certainly could do that, right? I mean, um, uh, there is kind of a sweet spot, I think. If you have very short things, then almost everything matches. For very, very long windows, nothing matches, because of course dimensionality, basically, as you might guess, everything's equally distant. So actually, if you plot the statistic, you kind of see this nice, clean bump here. And it's typically the way you expect to be the right answer for most domains, yeah. So like, um, for dance and martial arts, which we tried on for motion capture, it's again, it's about a half a second, right? That seems to be kind of plausible that uh, a move in dance might be about that length, and it repeats at different times in the dance. And even the best, dancer dancing to very 
synchronized music, they can't exactly repeat themselves with great fidelity much longer than a few seconds, right? Because they're going to go out of phase themselves a bit eventually. Sorry. What's your, what's your decision criteria for Okiki? So how do you decide one part is similar to the other part? So say that once more? How do you decide one, uh, one uh, part is similar to the other part? Oh, so this is measure that underlies this is Euclidean distance. So Euclidean distance is, you know, a very simple distance measure. But it turns out actually that for classification problems, Euclidean distance actually works incredibly well. There are many other kinds of measures you could have, like the number of time warp in, longest common subsequence. Actually, there's at least 50 different distance measures out there for time series. But when you actually do a fair test on classification problems, Euclidean distance actually basically wins every single time. It's kind of unfortunate because you kind of like some kind of clever idea to work, but the simplest thing you can imagine, Euclidean distance, works very, very, very well. These are all based upon Euclidean distance. So there is uh, some Euclidean distance threshold? Uh, so in the, in the motif case, you're minimizing that, 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 that Euclidean distance. You're simply finding the Euclidean distance has the minimum value. And once you learn that minimum value, you could actually maybe make a threshold out of that. So it is true, actually, that for small data sets, non-Euclidean things can actually work a little bit better. So the intuition is, someone's trying to find a face like my friend Kashuk here. If I have a million people in a room, there's a good chance I'll find a similar face to his, and there'll be very little difference or warp in between them. But in a smaller room, I can't find someone who looks like him so much, I have to warp or change his face more to match someone else's face. So for very small data sets, Euclidean distance actually kind of can handle the irregularities and the, the warp and the changes. Um, and so dynamic time warping or some other kind of metric can work very well. Once the data is reasonably large, as it turns out, Euclidean distance works beautifully. Anything else? Any more questions? Okay, then let's thank the speaker. Thank you.